you really can't when you're traveling like be stubborn and hold your ground and be yeah. like no 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 I'm right like you have to be willing to kind of back down and and um say you know like say I'm sorry like because yeah yeah because it happens right um hello I'm Alan Hill in this podcast series of the nostalgic vagabond we're talking travel all kinds of travel with all kinds of interesting people from all around the world in conversation we'll share personal anecdotes tales of adventure and maybe misadventure too. Listen in for some unique cultural perspectives, tips from seasoned veterans, and an array of diverse experiences that have contributed to many life-changing journeys. Travel really is a privilege. We know that now. And if we can't do it right this very moment, let's talk about it then. Hey, where are you right now? On this episode of the Nostalgic Vagabond podcast, I talk with Katie and Gorav, Together they are third culture nomads. Katie and Gorav come from different backgrounds, both born in one country, but more or less raised in another. Gorav and Katie found each other in Singapore when Gorav and his housemate welcomed Katie into their place as the newest housemate to fill the spare room. That's where their story began. But we'll get to that in a bit. In our conversation, we talk about what travelling was like for these third culture nomads individually, before they were a couple, and then how travel, even from their initial trips, began to define their relationship. Usually my guests are solo travellers, but in this talk we focus on factors of maintaining a healthy travelling partnership, as well as a healthy relationship, in general I think. Being a mixed race couple, as Katie and Gorav are, we talk about the learning opportunities that exist in this dynamic, and the gains which can be made through communicating feelings and perspectives to your partner. We talk about how we can change and evolve as travellers in the types we are and in the journeys we take, like train travel, which these nomads have grown to love. A little bit of tried and tested advice is always good, and I probe these guys for some useful tips. Towards the end, Katie and Gorav explain exactly what their name, Third Culture Nomads, means. Anyways, let's get to the conversation. All right. Welcome, Gorav and Katie from the Third Culture Nomads. How are you? Hi, we're good. <laughs> okay, good. Hi, Alan. Uh, and thank you for having us yeah. on the Nostalgic Vagabond. We're oh, really excited, excited about to be this. Here. Yeah. Yeah, you're very welcome. And where are you guys from uh, today? Are you zooming in from York, I believe? Yeah, uh, we're in York. We moved up a couple months ago. So, yeah, uh, so it's kind of like a new place for us. You were in London before, but you've been in many, many places, which we'll get to in a little while. Before we get to talk about your traveling independently, and more importantly, what this podcast episode is about, which is successful couples travel (laughs) with Gaurav and Katie, uh, I just wanted to get you guys to share a little bit about who you are and how you guys came to be uh, a couple and how did all that come about so who is Gaurav who is Katie and how did you guys meet you want to s- start first who is Katie um it's like a very existential question but <laughs> um so I guess basically like long story short so I was born in the in the U.S. and um when I was a couple weeks old my parents they were already living in Mexico at the time so what what they would do with their kids every time they were going to have a kid they would drive across the border and have a child so they kind of had this mo of like just crossing the border to make sure that their kids had the american citizenship and then they crossed back because they were living in mexico um and they're both americans as well yeah so i was a couple weeks old when um i moved to mexico and then i spent my entire childhood there until i finished high school and then i kind of um from there lived in different parts of the world. So like I lived in Cuba for a while and then I ended up in the States um, when I went to university and then moved to Taiwan. So eventually ended up in Singapore, which was where I met Gaurav. So yeah. <laughs> mm. And uh, yeah, um, I'm Gaurav. Uh, I was born in um, India in a place called Lucknow, um, which is in North India. But I grew up in uh, a city in uh, South India called Hyderabad which is sort of an IT hub, if you may. Huh. And uh, when I was about 15, I got a scholarship to uh, study in Singapore. Um, so I did my A-levels in Singapore. Then I went and finished my university in Singapore, my first job, and pretty much every more than half my adult life was in Singapore before we moved into London about five years ago. 
So I met Gary um, in uh, Singapore. And it's actually a funny story because... It's like a Bollywood film. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, of my, um, one of my best friends uh, who was moving out, we, we're living in a three-bedroom apartment in Singapore. Um, it was me, a uh, really good friend of mine. I'd sort of uh, grown up with him. And the third friend was leaving because he was going back to India to set up a business. So we're looking for a roommate. So we, we put up an ad on uh, an expat forum which I believe Katie responded to as well. Oh, no, I also put up an ad. So somehow I can't remember who got in touch with who, but I had put up an ad saying I was oh. looking for a place to stay. And this was like, I mean, I think this kind of also reflects on the kind of traveler I tend to be. Like I put up this ad a couple of weeks before I was actually moving to Singapore. So it was really very risky to be like, I hope in the next two weeks, you know, I find a place to live. Um, and I think... Uh, I started communicating with this guy like a week before I was going to fly out and pretty much settled it like a few days before I got on the plane. Yeah. And uh, and one of the selling points, funnily enough, when he was trying to like convince me like this is where I wanted to live, he explained like who Garov was and who the other flatmate um, was. And and he said, oh, well, like Garov and Ayush, who was the other guy, are kind of getting more into travel. And Garov's really interested in like exploring more. So like maybe that's something you guys could do together that you might do enjoy doing as friends. Like you could travel and things like that. Right from the beginning, something that that I knew about Garov, I guess. Yeah, very early on. And I remember clearly we, uh, me and my friend uh, Vignesh, who unfortunately uh, passed away last year, which is a big uh, setback for me personally and for us as a couple. Mm. So we were on an impromptu road trip. I think it was like Christmas time and Singapore gets quite... I, I think Singapore is like a place where most folks just get out any excuse they get, right? Uh, so we rented a car. I think we got the last car that's available for rental. We remember that clearly as well. And we went on an impromptu road trip to Kuala Lumpur or some of the uh, uh, Genting Highlands around there. And uh, the to and fro conversation that was taking place between Vignesh and Katie, he's like, dude, so there's this... So the two options we had, funnily enough, were both ladies. There were no... We didn't have any, any guys who wanted to stay. And <laughs> me and my friend who were both still living there, we like, I'm not sure if we want... We want to stay with a girl because we two boys and we've always sort of been. It was like a, it was like a man cave, if you may, right? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, not yeah. sure what I feel like when we have a lady coming in. It was, a, it was between a Malaysian uh, girl and it was between an American girl, right? And I think it, in the end. Yeah, I think Vignesh was like, yeah, I think I really Katie's sold okay. myself as very laid back, though. Like in my ad, I was like super chill. You know, <laughs> I'm a great flavate, so I don't know. Maybe that had something to do with <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, and it had nothing to do with the fact that she was willing to pay the full fare that was that was requested, and the other girl wasn't. So <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. had the cash I was you. loaded you know yeah. I came ready ready to play <laughs> <laughs> oh wow so you two guys met because you were housemates see that's that's quite interesting because I, I would have assumed before I known who you guys were that you met traveling mm -hmm. but you actually met living together but you were living in a country that was not your native country mm -hmm. which is also quite interesting what I'm curious about guys is before you two met in Singapore, what kind of traveling had you done beforehand? I mean, Katie, it seems like you had done quite a lot of traveling before you were in Singapore, and Gaurav was quite interested in traveling and had done some other trips himself. And so your independent trips before you met each other, what kind of adventures had you been on? Um, so I think for me, like I said, I'd always wanted to travel, but never for some reason, I was never the kind of person who traveled alone. I'd, I had to make sure I convince my friends and we make it a road trip or we make it like a guy's trip. And I think the more folks who sort of joined in, the merrier it got. So I, I, went, I had like a lot of road trips. We had like a crazy road trip in India uh, with the same friend I spoke about mm -hmm. earlier. We had a lot of uh, trips to Malaysia, to Thailand, to Indonesia, just because Singapore is so connected to Southeast Asia. So we had a lot of those sort of sure. escapades uh, where we just go and have a, have a ball and then come back in. Uh, but never really... Like go soul searching. I I didn't do that, uh, which is weird for me now. And uh, having spent the last decade with Katie, uh, never really got a chance to do that. It was always with somebody else, and it was always like a, a fun road trip or something along those lines. What about you, Katie? I don't know. I feel like a lot of my travel was usually me moving somewhere for a bit more long term. Um, I don't think I actually 
traveled where I went on a holiday, holiday, um, probably until I moved to Singapore. And then I, I took like a solo trip to Thailand. I mean, like I did road trips with my brother and things like that. But yeah, I guess most of my travel, it was me moving to another country and then staying there for at least a year. Uh, so it was probably like a very different kind of experience, I think. And and definitely like something I, I appreciate because I feel like, I, I don't know, I feel like it's a very fortunate position to be in where you can actually move to a new country and get a fuller experience, you know, living there for a longer period of time um, and traveling around the country and kind of like experiencing the culture for, you know, a longer period of time as well, making friends. But But I guess like the thing was, is I always did it on my own. It cured me very quickly of being afraid of traveling by myself because when I was 17, I moved to Cuba and um, lived there for about three and a half years because it was like such an extreme choice as well, like for a place to live. It just like cured me of, I mean, like, because I still get scared, but the thing is, is like, like you always get scared when you go on a trip, right? Like, especially by yourself, like it can be like you have a lot of nerves or anticipation, like, you know, what could go wrong? But I think like I realized that it didn't cure me of the fear, but it made me realize like you can deal with it, right? Like it's never as bad as you think it's going to be like when you're traveling by yourself, for example. It seems that, Katie, you'd had a lot of solo travel experience before you met Gaurav and Gaurav had Mm -hmm. traveled with his buddies exclusively and not really had much travel experience on his own. So when you two got together... And you bonded over the idea of traveling. Where did you go on your first trip together, the two of you? And what was it like? Were there any teething problems? Have you got any... Horror stories. (laughs) Maybe do's and don'ts that you've learned from that experience. Can you talk about your, if you can remember the details of your first trip together? Like we were debating this because... I, we remember our first two trips together. We went to Bali and went to Turkey. I'm not quite sure like which one came first, but I would say I would say like one of the things that looking back now we realized was like a very different way of travel for us, or like even how we've evolved since then. I guess like they were very busy trips. It was just very more in the mindset of like I'm going to sightsee, so I need to see this, 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 and knocking things off the list. Mm-hmm. So that was uh, probably our first experience traveling together. And I don't know if it's because you're more that way. So yeah. then it was kind of uh, I just kind of went along with it. I honestly can't remember. So I think early on, I remember the first few trips, and even in fact, the first uh, maybe the first couple of years, I was the primary trip planner. And Katie was the sort of person who'd be like, oh, I'll get, I'll go along with whatever it is that you plan. We'd obviously talk about things we want to do, places we want to see. But I was the resident expert of Asia, so to speak. So Katie sort of led it <laughs> cool. to me to say, all right, you, you're saying Bali, let's go down there, right? And I was, and I still am, maybe a reasonable amount. I, I put a lot of effort into my planning to say, all right, this is the place I want to be. I want to see all these different sites. So that was sort of my my way of doing things, if you may, right? And I think I didn't even really think before we went on a trip, for example, before we went to Bali, I didn't even, it never even occurred to me to be like, let me Google like the sites to see there, right? I was just kind of like, I'm going to show up. And then I remember like Garav would be like, oh, okay, well, there's this temple and there's this. So then like every day we'd kind of get up. And I think for me, it was more like, I'm just going to see what happens. And Garva would already have an idea in mind, which I don't think it was an issue because (laughs) otherwise I probably wouldn't have gotten around to seeing a lot of things we saw. But I do think like for one of our one of our early trips that we took to Sri Lanka, it, it did get to a point where that was where I actually put my foot down. And I was just like, okay, we cannot spend every single day, every time we take a trip, every single day with like a list of places to see and just go from one place to the next so i put my foot down there and i think that was probably our third trip together yeah third or fourth yeah. trip, I think. Uh, where i was just kind of like okay no nope, we have to come to a compromise where there's going to be at least one day preferably toward the end of the trip where literally we have nothing planned and nothing to do and we can just lie around by a pool if we want to or we can you know but just kind of like leave it empty because I think after a while for me, it was just too much to be kind of checking things off a list. And yeah. for Garav, like Garav 
enjoyed that type of travel more. So mm. because I mean, I think Garov also compromised very quickly and was and that's an important thing to do, right? When you're traveling together is like you kind of have to stop and be like, mm. okay, I respect that you don't travel exactly the same. You have a different personality. You have a different approach. So let's find a way that we can incorporate, you know, things that you enjoy or um, a, a method of travel that you enjoy and we can do both because it doesn't have to be one or the other, right? Sure. There's a lot of, uh, especially in our first few trips, I think we took a lot of big trips, right? Instead of going somewhere close home, we're like, all right, let's go to, let's go somewhere further away. And I think that brings in a, a sense of, unknown I mean and, and I think that helped us realize that we're there for each other and sort, sort of the word I think Katie used was compromise for some reason in my head compromise has a negative connotation to it I think we adjusted Are willing to adjust, together yeah. mm. that was the key element and I think because we traveled as much as we did in the first year of knowing each other in fact that sort of continued ever since um, I think we got closer a lot faster than a traditional sort of couple would because you really get to see uh, the bad and the ugly side when you travel, right? And I think if you can live through <laughs> yeah. that, because I mean, <laughs> no, it's funnily true, enough. Though. Like I think, I think because everybody, also because everybody curates their online image these days. So I think there are a lot of couples on Instagram who portray this idea that, oh, you know, like, oh, it's so glamorous and romantic and look at us in Paris. No, like a lot of times, you know, like you're both hangry or you're lost and like fights happen. <laughs> it's completely normal. It doesn't mean it's not working yeah. as a travel as a couple, right? It doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. It's just like, it's a normal thing. Like, you know, some, some days like your partner isn't going to look that attractive to you because you've been on a bus for like 18 hours or something, you know? So <laughs> you just have to like adjust your expectations, especially like be realistic about what you can expect from a trip with a partner, which is it's not going to be all like, oh, hand-holding and oh, this is great and this is great and we're doing this together. Yeah, some days you're really going to be kind of like, uh, why did I, what I, why did I agree to do this, you know? But I think it's like being willing to adjust your expectations and also being willing to come back and communicate with each other like what you think is or how you can kind of fix it or make it better for each other yeah uh i don't know if i was building on your point i kind of <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> i love a tangent <laughs> just keep wandering away okay what what i find interesting about you two guys specifically is from what you've been describing it seems that you're inherently different in personality so gorav seems to be at least in the beginning a very structured and a very organized and an itinerary based traveler which is what is comfortable and you Katie were very much laissez faire and almost the opposite of that just being free spirited and rocking up and seeing what happens i'm very impressed that's probably <laughs> the best word i can say that you guys have been able to be different in those ways yet be able to travel together in a way where you've learned about each other's differences and adapted and I agree with that uh, compromise word Gaurav that yeah it might have a negative connotation but you have adjusted yourselves to mutually benefit one another and the the overall experience and the relationship seems to have benefited through the traveling as well mm. would you say Gaurav? No absolutely and I think part of the reason for that Alan I think is the fact that we come from cultures which, which are very family oriented Right? Like there's a sense of uh, family before self, as opposed to maybe the Western ideology of self before everything else. Again, a generic uh, statement, but I think um, that sort of helped us put the other person in front and say, all right, this is what you want to do. I'm fine with that. Let's sort of maybe make that adjustment. Right? And I think the cultural backgrounds and the upbringing we had probably had a role to play in that as well. I think it probably wouldn't have gone um, as well if you we were very like-minded and very <laughs> we wouldn't stubborn. be here right now. Definitely no. <laughs> not. Um, and I think that had a role to play. I think we were already very conscious of the fact that, all right, you're from a different culture, I'm from a different culture, but inherently there's some underlying tones which sort of are similar in Mexican and Indian culture, I think. Mm. Um, and I mean, we... I think it's also great. Uh, sorry. No, no, go I, should... <laughs> uh, I think it's also great that's kind of like, we now we travel in ways that we probably wouldn't have imagined as individuals years ago. Mm. So we were actually talking about this recently about a trip we took to Milan 
two years ago. Yeah. And literally the only thing we did while we were there was drink a lot of wine, eat a lot of gelato, and basically like wander around. I don't even think we paid to go in to see, <laughs> do any sightseeing or museums or anything, which Milan has a lot of great stuff to see, right? <laughs> but I, and I was thinking, man, like when I first met Garov, I would have never imagined like Garov being laid back enough that he'd be like, I'm fine if all we do today is walk around and eat, try different gelato shops, right? Mm. So it's kind of like he's changed a little bit. And also like I've changed in in the sense that now I want to take ownership of trips and be like, nope, nope, you're not planning anything. I'm taking over this trip and I'm going to plan the whole thing because there's also sort of pride in it too to be like, okay, I planned this great trip for us, right? Yeah. So I think, like, yeah, like it's just interesting – how we've adjusted to each other's personalities, but also we've changed a little bit how we each travel to kind of like accommodate so that it's like a better experience as a couple as well. It's been fun to also learn different a different way to travel, right? Yeah. Um, to, mm. to kind of experience a different way to approach the world and approach um, visiting new places. So, yeah, I think yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. The evolution of us as sort of independent entities and together as a couple, I think that's, that's really I've, I've really seen the spectrum right because i went from being a strong planner to as katie said now there are trips where we just say we just have our entry and exit points nothing else is booked like mm-hmm. we don't book hotels or airbnbs no cars and we just rock up and we're like all right what do we want to do and i think that's obviously as uh, individuals we sort of matured and understood each other's likes and dislikes better and i think we've also evolved uh, to understand our travel preferences, right? So we've gone in from a place where, like like Katie, Katie mentioned in the first trip, I remember we rented like a scooter and I was off everywhere in that scooter. I, I was having a lot of fun, so was Katie, but I think maybe I was not as mindful of the fact that she's like, oh, I'm, there's a lot of sun here and I'm, I'm really tired and I'm anxious about making sure I get my food at a particular time. And those are the <laughs> things you learn. Like I've come to learn that, Katie needs to eat frequent meals, <laughs> right? So no matter where we are, I'm, I'm like, I'm the one okay. that gets hangry. <laughs> That's like, we got to make sure we figure out a way to get her her five, six, seven meals she needs in a day. We carry, right? we squirrel away snacks, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to make sure there's like and, every few hours. There's and these are, these are good habits right. to have in the large scheme of things because it's be- if you're in a foreign country, you don't, and we have both vegetarians as well. So mm. it adds that added complex. It's, it, I think it's getting better now when you travel. Uh, but not all the time right um, and these are the sort of things we've we've learned and picked up about each other and sort of evolved over the years and I think it's it, it's just making sure that you have the respect for the other person making sure that you respect the fact that it's not all about you there's someone else with you and you got to make sure it's an experience good experience for them and whilst making sure you you feel happy about it as well yeah I've got an interesting idea that I was thinking about just now as you were speaking with travel for me I always find that when you can push the limits of your comfort zone, that is where a lot of growth individually can take place. But also, I suppose, in reference to when couples are traveling, because you guys are inherently different personalities, would you say that your your process of evolution from going from being very, very structured and organized to being able to cope with sort of more spontaneity and freedom and vice versa has that maybe pushed your comfort zone and through traveling together as a couple you've been able to grow individually as travelers as well yeah i mean i i I think that like i've done things as an individual as well while traveling with gara for example that are challenging like one what i guess one thing that comes to mind is um I guess kind of related to spontaneity, but so last year we we took like a trip to oh no it was the year before we took a trip to um, Wales after Christmas, and then suddenly we were like let's try climbing Mount Snowdon, <laughs> and we had never like I had never climbed anything, <laughs> maybe a hill, but you know a small hill, um, <laughs> and it was kind of like I think that was something that. To me as an individual, it was very important to make make it all the way to the top, right? Like to achieve this. But it was also something that I probably would have never occurred to me and I probably might not have followed through with it if, if it hadn't been for Gaurav. Because I think 
like the way our dynamic works usually, and I don't know if this is good or bad, but when we end up in a challenging situation, so climbing Mount Snowden, for example, like we attempted it twice and we made it to the top the second time because the first day the weather got very, very bad. And, Mm. and there was a point where I was just like, I just stopped and I was just like, I'm cold, I'm wet. I want to go back down. And uh, what usually happens is that then Gara will react and be like, no, 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 we've got this. Like, we can make it to the top, right? But we did end up going back down because I, I just felt like it was too dangerous. But, like, that's an example of where where it's kind of like when I'm feeling, like, very challenged and I think, you know, I can't do this as a person. I can't, I can't finish this. I can't finish this trail. I can't, you know, like, I can't climb this mountain. Gar will kind of react and be like, no, no, you can't, you, you can do this. Okay. And, and he'll kind of like Mm. give that encouragement and it tends to happen when he's feeling down. I don't know, for some reason, it's like one of us will always react and be like, no, 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 you got this. And, and I guess like another example is we earlier this year, because we haven't been traveling, um, we've been trying to find like interesting things to do. And we did, um, a bridge walk where we walked um, every bridge in London. There's a there's a background story <laughs> to that, which I think I'd like. Uh, I want so to how many bridges? Into. Like 23 bridges? Yeah, there's 23 bridges. So I think the story story for that was I casually just mentioned, I was like, oh, maybe we should do the London Bridges walk. Because actually Jade, uh, who was a common friend uh, of ours, mm-hmm. I think she mentioned that. And in fact, we met her dad, I think, who was... Uh, was it last year when he was he was oh, doing his London Bridges ago, walk? Yeah. So I was like, "There's was a London Bridges a marathon charity." Yeah, and I was like, "Oh wow, that sounds like fun." Mm. So I just casually mentioned it to Katie. I was like, "Oh, <laughs> maybe we should do the London Bridges uh, walk, right?" And to me, that's just a statement. But to Katie, that's that's like, "Oh, that's well, a mission." She's like, "Oh, right, I'm gonna plan this out," <laughs> and she's like, "She just said." Tomorrow morning we're gonna do this, and this is like a week later, right? She's like, and I'm like, "Yeah, we're not doing this." And she wakes me up at like mm-hmm. five in the morning. She's like, all right, let's go. I'm like, go where? She's like, the London Bridges. <laughs> We're going to do it. We're going to do the marathon. I'm like, I was joking. She's like, well, I wasn't. So <laughs> we ended up doing something of like that. And that ended up being like a crazy thing. I think we walked for like it 14 took hours. took us 14 hours. And it was over 70 kilometers. Yeah. And the thing was, is that wow. I wouldn't have been able to do it by myself. And I mm. don't think you would have either. Right. And it was kind of like it was an individual achievement. But at the same time, like there were points towards the end, especially where it was like, if you sat down, you would not get up again yeah. because it was just you were just in pain. Your muscles were all cramping up. You know, you'd been walking on pavement for like 14 hours. And it reached that point where Gaurav started to say at one point, like, oh, we could just get on a bus and bus home, you know? <laughs> and then, like, for me, then I would react like, no, 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 we can't give up. Like, we have to we have to keep going. And I think that's what's special about it is that it kind of helps us achieve things as individuals, but things that we might not be able to achieve if we didn't have the support of the other person. Mm. Yeah, so it's, I think, yeah, it has, as an individual, at least for me, I feel like it's made me more adventurous. It's made me more willing to try, like, very difficult things that ordinarily I would be like, that's insane. Like, why would you walk this far, you know, in a day? Like, it's definitely, definitely helped me personally. I feel, I don't know how you feel, but, like, made me more confident, for example, individually it has been beneficial no I, I definitely agree with that i think you get to see the world from another perspective right and i think that always adds to the experience another example of the same thing that mm-hmm. katie is mentioning is we are in uh, oaxaca in mexico and they have these uh, these crickets they call them chapulines right and that's part of the cuisine mm-hmm. there and Katie, when it comes right. to traveling, although she's vegetarian, she wants to, like the chapulin, she's like, actually, I want to try that once. I think she's also had a, a fried tarantula in uh, uh, Thailand. Or, I mean, I remember where. If somebody offers it to me, I'm going to be like, huh, okay. You know, like, I, I don't want to regret not trying it, I guess is the problem. And, yeah. Yeah. and in my head, I'm like, yeah, there's no way I'm eating a cricket. Right? Like, that just looks weird. And, I'm, and Katie's like, no, no, you got to try it. <laughs> And I was like, all right, I, I think it was a pizza which is sprinkled with some crickets. It was the most <laughs> bizarre thing I've, I'd seen at that point in time. Uh, but I was, I was game enough and I was like, all right, wow. I'm going to have a bite. I'm going to try it and put your mental block away and, and you get to sort of immerse in the um, in the local experience. And I think that's something I definitely wouldn't have done as a solo traveler. And 
it helps open up your your horizons and your mind really yeah it seems like you guys do well at pushing each other to go beyond your individual comfort zones and it seems like you've got a good relationship where when someone's struggling the other person can lift them up and mm-hmm. and vice versa on depending on the day i think that's really nice i've got a question about the fact that you guys are a traveling couple but you're of different genders and of different race and i'm just very curious how that has influenced your traveling and are there any examples where you've been somewhere and you might have seen the same situation through different eyes and you've been able to discuss that later on and and even get perspectives you'd never even considered yeah i think there's a fair few experiences i think Katie and i speak about that pretty much all the time i think as a man i get to see her experiences as a a uh, female traveler and other things which i was i generally take for granted and and having traveled with kedi as like all right you know what i can i can sense that like for example we were in sri lanka we having a great time as we were there for new year's eve and there were there were times when uh, kedi felt unsafe and i was like nah this, what do you mean unsafe there's there's nothing here it's all fine and i mm. could have been more sort of respectful of the fact that as a girl or as a lady uh there are certain things where you feel unsafe and that's just a part of um that's just part of travel in certain countries mm-hmm. and i've sort of my eyes have opened up to that but i'm now more aware of the fact that right, it's getting late not the most logical thing for us to be down here together although we together as a couple i now i'm more understanding of the fact that there are certain things that are inherently different just because uh, katie is a lady and i'm a man i think i've become more conscious of that mm-hmm. and of course um uh, the the other thing was and that that's that's a pretty big thing uh was about our race as well i think uh when we first started traveling and in fact uh, still in a lot of parts of the world interracial couples are they they they're getting uh, i think they're getting more popular but they were not as they were not a thing mm-hmm. um definitely not in southeast asia as much right. and i've i've seen like a trend like there've there've been a lot of incidents where an experience that let's say kedi has as a caucasian uh a girl would be very different from my experiences as an indian traveler and indian male traveler but together i think we've managed to figure out a way where we maybe don't get the best of both the worlds but we find a middle ground and we we get an experience which is on par with where, where i think both of them both of us feel happy right and uh, i don't I know mean, i think it really made me think though because obviously like if you move through like i think garav was probably you know like i'd never met indians uh, before uh, moving to singapore mm-hmm. you know because like even when i like i lived in latin america most of most of the time and then uh even in texas which is where i went to school it wasn't i guess so diverse that you got you know like a very international mix yeah so i think it was like meeting garov and then when we started dating it was when i really started to think about how the color of your skin can give you a certain privilege when you travel that you don't actually realize until um you see somebody you care about experience you know like have a bad experience mm-hmm. and i guess because also like you know when i traveled to taiwan when i traveled to all these different places i always consider myself very very lucky because whenever i was in trouble or i needed help with something there was always someone who was willing to help me and i actually think a lot of that had to do with the fact that i'm white and probably help that i'm a woman because it's like oh vulnerable you mm. know like let me help you out yeah and i think i became more aware of this idea that okay if i had been you know brown for example um if i were an indian woman would i have gotten the same treatment i honestly don't think so right i don't think people would have been, would have been as quick because in a lot of the countries like in taiwan for example like there's still a lot of prejudice against people who are you know like yeah like people of color i guess yeah so i think like being with garov and um especially like now that we've been together for so long it's definitely made me a lot more uh, aware of how very different your experience can be um when you're not a white traveler it's kind of sad to say i guess because i think we all hope to live in this world where it's like oh we've progressed enough where this isn't an issue but it's kind of it still is right and it's like we still have experiences like where i remember we 
we were in Texas a couple years ago and we went into a restaurant and sat down and Gaurav just kind of in a very low voice said to me, oh, I am the only non-white person here, <laughs> right? And for me, it was kind of like, I didn't even think about it. Like I just walked in, I was like, people, you know? Like it never occurred to me that mm. that would make him feel uncomfortable, slightly uncomfortable, right? This fact that it's just like, you're just like the only person that's really standing out in this situation and it's kind of makes you feel weird. Yeah. And then, and then like we've had like cases where we, we stayed at an Airbnb in Ireland some years ago and we had like an entire conversation with the host. And then afterward, and, and again, like it just completely went over my head. I did not notice. Uh, Gar was like, she never looked at me. Mm. Like, she never spoke to me. She never looked at me. Like, every question she had, she directed it. She would direct it at me, but she wouldn't look at Garov or speak to Garov. And I don't know if it's, like, if that was necessarily prejudice or maybe she thought, oh, he might not speak English as well or, like, she was making assumptions. But, yeah, but it was kind of, like, uh, I've tried to become more aware, I guess, because I think it's just so – it's 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 strange, but it's like a, a learning curve, I guess, yeah. And I think, like I said – at the end of the day, there's there's good and bad, uh, but I think we've like as uh, like mm. I uh, said earlier, we I've we've tried to figure out a way to sort of make it work for us, right? So there's a lot of pros pros of the same thing, right? For example, like I said, uh, uh, like we mentioned earlier, we bring a different uh, perspective, right? Because of the fact that we're from different backgrounds and different genders, mm -hmm. and that sort of helps enable widen our thinking and our thought process and hopefully re reduces our prejudices a little bit and, and that's that's definitely a big uh big advantage of having of, of being interracial i think it also makes it safer uh at least it makes me feel mm. safer because in the sense that there are still a lot of stereotypes for western women as well like in like latin america and even in lots of lots many countries in asia so in a weird way, like being with Garav, I feel like it gives me some sort of legitimacy where people don't look at me and judge me and think about me in a certain way because I'm a white Western woman, which is odd to say. I don't know uh, like how to explain it exactly, but I don't know if it maybe makes me seem more legitimate as in, oh, more culturally aware. So then I'm not going to judge you and think, yeah, I don't know, think uh, think a certain way about you as a woman. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> no, I think I know what you're trying to say, but uh, but I think in the end, like I said, there's 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 both good and bad, um, and I think we've we've learned to acknowledge and understand the bad that comes with being a a, a female uh, traveler and being a non-white uh, traveler, respectively. Um, and I think we sort of mm. figured out a way around it and we try and at, at times we forget about it. And I think that's ultimately where we want it to be, where it doesn't really matter if you're what the color of your skin is or what the sex uh, or, or whether you're male or female. Um, and I think that's where we want it to be. And I think we're making we're making strides as a society to get there, but obviously probably not going to happen in our lifetimes. Um, mm. It seems like you guys have had many, many interesting conversations with each other about your perspectives and your backgrounds and you've probably had an opportunity that a lot of people necessarily don't get where you can be so enlightened in these areas because you've had first-hand uh, stories from people you know well and you've been able to get honest reactions to situations that you can see through different eyes and I think that's going to benefit you guys as well and, and benefit your relationship too so that's something that I think is is quite beneficial for having these variations in personality and viewpoints, providing you can mm. have a dialogue with each other and not be, you know, um, one-sided or narrow-minded, but just embrace all these different perspectives and try and learn all the time about the different ways you can see the world. I think that's that's really mature and yeah, really oh. nice. <laughs> so <don't> know, <laughs> no, I was just going to say... Um, and a big part of it is just accepting when somebody tells you, this is what's happening to me. You know, like, for example, like Garav tells me, mm. like, that woman didn't look at me when she spoke to us. The important thing is not to say, oh, it must be in your imagination mm. or like, I'm sure that's not true. But to accept like that is your experience, you know, and maybe I can't comprehend it because, you know, like I'm a different type of person. Mm and I'm a different gender, or I'm a different, uh, like, skin color. But just to acknowledge it and, and 
make that person feel like, okay, I feel seen by my partner in that they're acknowledging that I feel like this is what I've experienced um, and not just brushing it off as, you know, like it doesn't matter because it does. Yeah, Mm -hmm. like it does matter. And you should be able to express it when, you know, like feel free to express it and have someone acknowledge that's what you're going through. And I think the the other thing which sort of continues into that point is is perspective. I, I think I mentioned that earlier, but uh, as an example, I am in general not very trustful of people I don't know, for example, especially when I'm traveling. I'm like, all right, I'm going to make sure that I don't give a person the benefit of the doubt unless I have to, right? right. Katie, on the other hand, is completely trusting of anybody. Right? And I think, <laughs> anybody, but well, yeah. <laughs> in general, right? And I think... <laughs> we've, we've influenced each other to sort of balance that out so mm. i've changed my perspective where i'm like okay i don't know you but i have no reason to distrust you now so i'm going to start by offering you the benefit of the doubt and then see how that pans out and by the same token katie is now sort of moved her angle slightly more to the center where she's like all right i i'll obviously be more aware of the fact that i can't be so trusting to complete strangers although that does lead to certain really interesting experiences mm. i've had garov like snatch food out of my hands that has been given to me by strangers because he's just like you don't know what's in that and he like throws it away and, so, and i'll just be like oh thank you sir you know it's taking the crackers or whatever but yeah so so i, I think that's also part and parcel of the cultural differences that exist uh, in 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 our in our mm. particular case, and I think it it lends itself to some really enjoyable experiences most of the time, and some odd experiences here and there where where it sort of leaves a sour taste in the mouth. But like I said, we've adjusted, and I think we acknowledge each other's feelings, and I think that's really important to make yeah, sure. Yeah, you that, have to be open to learn. Yeah, like learning, and it's not a process that ends. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's still because travel is like something. You know, when you love it, you're going to do it, hopefully, like, as long as you can, right? So it's it's kind of like when you're always going to be learning something new when you travel. It's the same thing when you're in, like, a a couple that's, like, interracial, for example. When you're a couple that's interracial, then, yeah, like, it's going to continuously be a learning experience where you're learning something new about the other person, about their experience, about how they experience the world differently from you. It's just like good to have an open mind and be like, I'm willing to learn and try to see the world from your perspective as well. Yeah, it seems like you guys are dedicated to a continual process of evolution and self-improvement and growing as a couple. In saying that, I'm curious, as it currently stands, how would you describe yourselves in terms of what types of travel do you like to do and what types of travelers are you? I think we've definitely, at least over the last three to four years, we've we've started doing sort of slow burn travel, right? So we spend longer on our vacations and we sort of take it really slow. We love taking long train journeys uh, where you really get to sort of sit back and relax. So I think we've gone from the really chaotic and hectic sightseeing very organized yeah, exactly sightseeing like... days <laughs> to sort of the complete opposite almost where we like actually you know what the more chilled out it is the better it is mm. and i think that's sort of a preferred uh approach right now and i think the other thing we're also getting as, as i'm sure so is the rest of the world uh if not hopefully they are uh we started getting more conscious about our footprint right so i think mm. taking the train sort of re- reduces a lot of that carbon footprint that you potentially have and if you travel we take uh we, we travel locally now as opposed to going abroad and saying all right i'm gonna go do this certain times obviously you can't uh, avoid it like for christmas we generally spend uh christmas in the states with uh, katie's uh parents mm-hmm. um and then we sort of figure out a way to take a road trip in the u.s or canada or wherever else it might be just to sort of um, extend that uh, experience but i think in general for us slow travel is 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 really what has sort of been pushing us in the last three, four years at the very least. Yeah, I mean, I think we've really, really slowed down, honestly, because because also like when, obviously when we met, we lived in Singapore and Singapore is very centrally located, but to get anywhere, you pretty much mm-hmm. have to fly, right? And it's just so easy to go places because I think Bali is like less than an hour away. I think it's two or, or three hours. Or is it two hours? Yeah. Okay. Um, but still, like, that's, you know, not far at all. And you just hop on a plane and tickets are cheap. So then I think at first we kind of fell into this 
habit of just taking all these really short little trips uh, throughout the year, which is terrible for the environment, obviously, but at, at some point, and there was even one year where we were like, we have to visit a different place every month. Like that was our yearly goal. And then it got to a point where we were kind of like, okay, like, is it quality or quantity that we're looking for, you know? And because it's it's easy to say like, oh, I've been to all these places, you know, but if you like just fly in and spend two days there, like what what kind of quality experience are you having? So I think that really made us stop and think kind of, okay, like maybe we should just slow this down and do two trips a year, which are just longer trips where you really can enjoy and take your time with the country you don't feel. And also it's like less less pressure, right? It takes the pressure off because then you don't arrive and think, okay, I have to hit the ground running because I only have three days to see everything that I want to see. Um, it kind of gives you a chance to be like, oh, okay, like I've arrived. Let me go to the local bar and hang out for a bit. You know, like you just kind of really, it's it's easier to just take check out the vibe yeah yeah like see what's going on yeah <laughs> yeah so i think that's definitely how we've changed a lot and also since we became a couple we also both became vegetarians um which also is kind of i don't know our way of i guess maybe trying to offset our carbon footprint because we still travel right but just being more i think we've become more mindful as a couple as well since we started dating and gotten married our impact on the world in in more ways than one, including like what we consume, what we eat and um, yeah, like how we travel, like quick travel or slow travel, like what's actually better for the planet. Yeah. And even things we were, we were just talking yesterday, I think we were saying we used to go abroad and we'd buy like all these little trinkets because for some reason we would think like, oh my gosh, we need to have like things from this country we visited. And I don't know, like it felt kind of like then you just accumulate clutter and then a lot of it you end up getting rid of because it's, yeah, like it's just, it doesn't have like hold like a lot of value unless there's a memory attached to it. Uh, so then we we stopped buying things just to buy them and kind of uh, started to think, okay, um, what would be like more mindful way to have memories from these places. So like photos, you know, is definitely more eco-friendly, for example. <laughs> um, yeah, things like that. So yeah, I think we've vastly mm -hmm. changed how we travel um, from when we first started to how we travel now, which is, yeah, slower, um, consuming less, definitely trying to be a lot more mindful. Yeah. Do you guys have a, a favorite memory on a trip or a particular experience that stands out as like a milestone or a, a turning point in your journey? I mean, favorite trip i think there's a couple which i'm pretty sure both of us will probably agree on right like so a milestone milestone might be slightly more tricky but i think if you talk about favorite memories the onsens in japan the uh trans-siberian oh, the I think trans siberian yeah these would these would be really high up the uh the the night under the sky uh, under the stars in uh in oman mm. In the I'm trying to desert. think, like, what was our first slow travel? I would actually say train. Probably Ooh, trains yes. were a big turning train. point for us. Yeah, I would say like, mm. uh, we took our first big train journey in this in the U.S. I think it was 2016, 2015, 2015 maybe. maybe. Yeah, um, it's been a while. But <laughs> what was it? It was like it wasn't the California Zephyr. It, it was. It was California. No, it Zephyr. was San Francisco to Chicago. I thought. I think that's the California Zephyr. Oh, maybe. Yeah. So uh, basically, it's like uh, Amtrak. It's Amtrak. So uh, and it, it goes from California to to Illinois to Chicago. Um, and I think it was like four days. Four days. Wow. And and it, like, I guess for any train aficionados out there, uh, Amtrak is not the best train travel out there. You know, like for some reason, it's just like it's underfunded. It's always delayed. Like there's always issues with it. The food isn't great, right? Yeah. But we had no idea about this when we did it. So to us, it was just like this <laughs> huge novelty. And I think um, that was definitely a turning point for us as far as like, it made us realize how pleasant mm. just taking your time can be, right? So, um, and, and yeah. it just really made us, like we fell in love with train travel. And I think that's like really changed how we travel now because if we hadn't done that, I don't think we would have done the Trans-Siberian last year. We wouldn't have done the Canadian a couple of years ago. Um, so it just really got us into mm. 
this whole idea of just like spending days on a train and you just talk to all these different interesting people, right? Because when they sit you for meals, they always will sit you with somebody different. So we met like somebody who worked on the Lord of the Rings uh, movies, wow. you know? Yeah, like all these. And this guy, uh, we met this retired train conductor who just basically like spends his time riding trains for free. You know, like you just meet like these interesting people. Some people we've met that are still friends of ours, you know, that we still talk to all the time. So yeah, so I think it just made us think of travel. I think it was a big turning point because it made us think of travel less in the sense of what can I see and more of what I can experience. Like who can I meet? You know, like what sort of mm. conversations can I have? Like what, yeah, like what kind of like really slow um, taking your time with it kind of experience can I have? Yeah, I don't know. And also made, made us maybe think more in the sense of like putting people over uh, just sightseeing, right? Like where it's like, it's actually more fun to just meet interesting people sometimes and just like talk to interesting people with different experiences from around the world um, as opposed to just being like, I have to sightsee and I got to go see the Eiffel. I got to go see this. I got to go see this, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's just a more personal <laughs> experience, I guess, because it's also something you can take away with you with lasting friendships sometimes mm -hmm. that it, it just like really impacts you for years and years, right? Indeed. So I would say that, sorry, I feel like I keep taking over the conversation. But yes, I, I do feel like <laughs> train the first train journey we did was a big turning point for us. And then, and then we like upgraded to the Canadian, which is like super fancy. Well, not super fancy, but it was really nice in comparison to Amtrak. It was amazing. And then we did the Trans-Siberian and that was pretty crazy too. But yeah. Again, it's a process of evolution. You're, you're continually growing in, in your journeys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think um, I definitely tend to agree with Katie um, that I think that was a milestone event for us because I think we evolved in our way we travel. I mean, not to say we we do, I think we do at least a couple of train journeys every year now, which I think is, is something we actively look out for, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. this year is an exception for pretty much the entire world. So we haven't done anything this year. Uh, but yeah, I think we've we've evolved into sort of road trips and train trips as opposed to flying around everywhere. And I think that, that brings in a different set of challenges and a different set of experiences because you're, you're in more close sort of quarters with, with another traveler. I think it it adds another dimension and, and it gives us more chances to grow as individuals. And as Katie mentioned, uh, we met some really, really uh, great people on these trains, generally elderly folks who give you another perspective on life. And, and I think that really, uh, really excites us. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's added uh, more more diamonds. So, for example, for this year, we're supposed to be in Australia right now. Oh, right. We met this uh, elderly couple who are Aussies from Melbourne. Um, I think uh, the Jeff and Jan. All right. A shout out to them. I'm sure I'm going to tell them about it. <laughs> or we're going to tell them about it. <laughs> we'll have to tell them about um, this. And, uh, <laughs> Send uh, them a link to so they can listen. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff's a sprightly 80-year-old uh Man and Jan's uh, about seventy. I think 70s. she's in her seventies, yeah. And they really inspire us because that's some sort of something we aspire to be, like traveling at that mm -hmm. age and and together and sort of going through experiences. And we traveled. Uh, we intended to do our, our train journey for this year was intended to be uh, the Ghan, I think it's called, mm -hmm. and that is what we're planning to do. But obviously, uh, we'll probably push that to whenever we get a chance to visit them next. These are the sort of things we, we've picked up along the way. And I think that milestone event, I definitely tend to agree, um, that that was definitely a turning point for us. Mm. And I think, too, because we, we actually had the Trans-Siberian on our bucket list. I think it's on a lot of people's bucket yeah. list, right? Because it's just like one of those iconic things that you're like, I got to do this once in a lifetime. We had it on our list before we even started traveling on trains. But I think to us, it was just like this very... So far away. Yeah, like it was just like maybe too difficult to figure out like can we actually do that and then i think like doing the amtrak then we're kind of like oh this is more doable like this so then i feel kind of like we managed to cross that off our bucket list just by trying to do um something that was maybe slightly less intimidating then we're like oh wait like we actually enjoy this because also like the trans-siberian is i want to say five days six is it six days and you're just sitting on a train. So if you think about it and you've never done something like that before, you're like, oh my God, well, I hate this, you know? Like I'm going to just be sitting on a train in like a foreign country. 
the Amtrak definitely made us realize like, oh no, this is kind of fun. You know, like all you got to do is read a book and then chat people up and, you know, it's great. Play cards. <laughs> um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So it made it more, more achievable, I guess. To Yeah. It seems like you guys had a, a progress of levels of, of going from a easier stage to a more difficult stage, at least in terms of travel. Yeah. I've got a, uh, almost like an advice question, I suppose, that I want to ask you guys. <laughs> and that's, what would you say are the three most important things to maintaining a successful relationship when traveling? Um, I think the first thing has to be communicate, communicate, communicate. Because yeah. if you don't communicate well, then that's not going to end up well, I think. The pressures that travel puts on 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 any couple it it manifests itself in ways which you cannot sort of pre plan you cannot fathom it and if you do not communicate well it it'll not end up very very well. I think that's the first sort of advice I'd definitely give yeah, I mean also yeah, like you have to be when you travel as a couple like you you can't keep things to yourself like you really do have to communicate with the other person like what's going on with you um what you're feeling in certain situations um yeah so i i agree like i think you you definitely have to be able to to communicate with each other and i think like and i don't think it's like something you automatically have you know when you start traveling together i think it's something that develops over time gets better over time but you have to be willing to kind of yeah, to do to work at that and um yeah, like figure out ways uh to communicate more clearly with each other. And when I say communicate, I mean it's not just blunt communication, it's gotta be communication whilst being respectful of the other person's point of views, the other person's feelings. So it's sort of meaningful communication and it's sort of more uh, nuanced. Uh that way it's not just like, oh, I wanna do this at this point in time. You got to be obviously understanding and respectful. Going back to the point we discussed a little about compromise, right? So it's got to be yeah. it's got to be communication whilst keeping in uh, uh, mind your your partner's preferences and and making sure that it becomes a pleasant experience for the both of them. I think that's definitely the first advice. Oh, we um, been talking about this a lot too. Uh, I don't know if it's advice necessarily, but so we have kind of taken a step back from like social media this year, um, I think because, and I'm sure this happened for a lot of people, but just kind of like the situation in general, I think not traveling actually made us think a little bit about how much do you enjoy travel if you're constantly documenting everything? Like it was just something that kind of came up for us. Uh, and so we took a little bit of a step back from, you know, like Instagram, because I also feel, feel like when lockdown hit, then there was like, everybody felt kind of like this pressure, like keep posting, you know, you have to keep saying like, I'm doing yoga, I'm doing this. And then we started to talk about like, oh, well, as travelers, it's more important to, and I'm not saying like, it's bad to document things. Obviously, like we love taking photos, right. But, uh, but just kind of like this idea of like, can we be present in the moment together and experience this together? I don't know. I think that's like, as a couple, that's something that's really important because I think it's very easy to get lost in this idea that, no, I'm busy taking a video or I'm doing this or I'm documenting it instead of just like enjoying a sunset together or just kind of like being very mm. present with each other and whatever experience you're having because a lot of these experiences are once in a lifetime. Yeah, so just kind of this idea, I don't know if it counts as advice, but I guess like this idea to just be more aware of each other and where you're at in the moment and uh, try to enjoy it without um, all these kind of barriers where you feel this pressure to to make sure like you somehow document it, you know, because also because it's a shared memory. So then you're lucky because mm -hmm. if you're traveling with someone, uh, you can share that memory together and you'll always be able to have that, right? Um, you don't necessarily need to have a photo of it or anything. You can just be like, it's something that you already have together. Yeah, I guess like communication, <laughs> let's narrow it down here, communication, and then kind of just being present in the moment together. Um, yeah. yeah. And and just building up on that, right? I mean, I think it's, 
the advice on on that particular. You're one, not I think. getting any short answers today. Alan. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you ask like one question that could have two senses to answer nah. it, and we're like, nah. nothing. <laughs> but also, there's been no arguing. So there you go. <laughs> but I have noticed the color of your mug has changed. So I'm just wondering if you have like three mugs in with like coffee. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it like just like your stash of coffee <laughs> for like the? I have one with just water and one with some caffeinated beverage. Oh, got uh, it. <laughs> the, I think the advice you could sort of take away from that, and I think it's something we've tried to implement as well. When you're going on a trip, let's say it's for X number of days, if maybe set a set a goal where, you know, because documenting something is very natural now, it's just the way of life uh, for a lot of people. Mm. If you can set up a goal where you're saying, for X days, I will only take Y photos, Right. So, for example, you're going on a 10 day trip. I'm not going to take more than 20 photos. Then you really think long and hard about what is that one photo you want to take if you really want to do that. Right. Because, again, uh, going back to the evolution of us, like I was very trigger happy with my camera mm-hmm. and I should like document everything. And we have so many pictures of food. Yeah, and, and <laughs> food, food especially. <laughs> like, I can just go back to our first trip to Bali and just look at, like, pictures of... I mean, it's beautiful food, but it's kind of like, what am I ever going to do with this Exactly, photo? right? <laughs> and, and then the memory of us actually sitting there eating together is sort of fuzzy because we're, we're in that moment taking photos and we're, like, not really talking. Mm. So... Now, instead of doing that, we like I said, we take more than no more than one or two photos. In fact, we travel I mean, we within, tried to narrow it we down, travel within yeah. uh, Instapix, right? So that sort of reduces even more the photos you can take. You can just take one photo, it comes out instantaneously, and that's it. That's our memory. That's a memory clip right. for that particular moment. Right. And I think that is a good, that's been really good for us because then we can be in the moment physically and sort of cherish it and remember it. Yeah, and I guess don't take it for granted, right? Um, travel is such a privilege that it's just kind of, it's easy to just kind of take the moment for granted and be like, oh, I'd rather get a good photo of this. And yeah, like I guess instead of just experiencing it sometimes, yeah. And and um, the third and final piece of advice. <laughs> we finally got around to it. <laughs> um, would be respect the culture. Respect the culture of the country you're traveling to. Because I've seen this enough times where people just go and just do what they feel like doing without necessarily respect respecting uh, the place they're visiting or understanding the cultural implication of that. Mm. It doesn't hurt to do a little bit of research maybe. But, but I feel like that's not really couples. Fair enough. Advice but for couples. I guess all the more, I, I, maybe for couples, uh, the, the context of that would be, I don't know, maybe if you go to Asia in general and refrain from PDA, I guess. Or oh, some, something things of that like sort. that. Yeah. Yeah, Just be so. respectful of the What's culture. What's PDA? Oh, Public, public display of affection. affection. Oh, of course, yes. Yeah, like, right. you know, like in India, for example, we would never hold hands mm. even, right? Um, I guess, yeah, like that is a good point. Like you do have to be aware of certain things as a couple that is just kind of uh, what's acceptable in your culture isn't always acceptable everywhere mm. else. So I mm. guess, yeah, like be very True. aware as a couple what, what are the cultural expectations of the country you're traveling to, yeah. Be respectful of that culture because you might think – the world that you know is the same everywhere, but it obviously isn't. And I think mm. it's just important just to be conscious of that and, and respect that. And I think especially Can, as a couple. I right, do want to add something, something, something though. I want to just say, okay, <laughs> I think it's very, very important as a couple that you you have to be willing to, I guess like obviously with communication, but like to apologize or oh, yes. to, yeah, like to come back because there have been so many times and especially this happens, tends to happen when we're on road trips, for example, because Gaurav does not, despite not driving, Gaurav is a very, <laughs> very uh, controlling, what is it, like secondhand driver? Yeah. yeah. Backseat driver? Yeah, backseat driver. Like he'll just sit there and make commentary, <laughs> nonstop commentaries about how I should be pulling around, I should get over to the side, I should do this. <laughs> <laughs> and that that can like kind of like I mean it does it does wear a little bit away you know like it's kind of like <laughs> too much of it is too much but yeah like uh there, there's I think where we tend to argue the most is usually in a car because because that's just kind of like you know after a while you're just like ah um but yeah but then uh to be able to just be kind of willing to acknowledge like oh, okay what I did upset you and I'm sorry about that like being willing to apologize instead of you can't you really can't when you're traveling like 
be stubborn and hold your ground and be yeah. like, no, 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 I'm right. Like you have to be willing to kind of back down and, and um, say, you know, like say, I'm sorry. Like, cause yeah, yeah because it happens. Right. Um, yeah. Especially when you're hangry or you're <laughs> tired from a, a long journey, you can, you can react in a way that wouldn't be perhaps a typical way for you mm-hmm. to react. And that's when you cross the line and that's when you need to take, like you say, a step back and go, right. Yeah. Let's apologize and move forward from yeah, this. Yeah, and I think also you have to learn how to give each other space even when you don't have space to, to kind of lead up to, yeah, to lead up to an apology. Um, Yeah, so like when you're in a car together, like there's nowhere you can go, but uh, you have to be willing to kind of be like, okay, I'm going to take a step back. We're going to cool off for five minutes in our own respective areas and then <laughs> kind of come back together and say, okay, you know what? I, uh, I get it. Yeah. yeah. Sorry I reacted that way or I'm sorry I said this or yeah, because it can be it can be tense when you travel sometimes, right? Totally. <laughs> all, all very sound advice. Good tips. Well, you got four pieces of advice. It's I so know. Great. I got I got more than I bargained <laughs> for. Lord, probably in more ways than one. It's just like, <laughs> when's this gonna end? <laughs> My favorite four. What I'll do is I'll ask the questions, and you guys can just give your respective answers for that particular one, and then I'll move on to the next one. Okay. We'll see if any arguments ensue. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Katie and Gaurav, mm-hmm. what is your favorite ocean or sea? <laughs> I didn't know you could have a favorite. Um, okay. I think You're terrified Indian, of the ocean. I'm, I am terrified so. of the ocean. I'm terrified of water <laughs> I don't think Gaurav has a favorite ocean. But... <laughs> I would say Pacific because I grew up on the Pacific Ocean. I think I'd probably say Indian Ocean because that's the only place I've probably Bit gone patriotic, swimming. patriotic, are you? No, no, in Sri Lanka, that's the only place I've <laughs> gone swimming. I think Is it's it? the confluence of Arabian Sea, Indian Ocean, and a third body, of water, third, uh, body of water, which I can't remember now. But that's the only place I've gone swimming, in an ocean. Oh. But I almost drowned Katie, but that's for another day. <laughs> this, this is a good one for you guys. What is your favorite foreign word? Ooh. Oh, oh I, I know mine. <laughs> it's a made up word. So Katie is a polyglot. She speaks a lot of languages. Right. She oh, speaks no, no, Spanish, no. <laughs> English. Oh she's learning French. She's making me sound way more and <laughs> she speaks, than I am. Uh, she's, she's learned Mandarin in the past to, to live in Taiwan right. for as long as she did. So I remember uh, we were in Spain and I kept saying, <laughs> All right. I thought, excuse us. <laughs> Is the word which me, which is the Spanish word for excuse me, right? So I, was, I kept saying excusar, 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 and everyone's like looking at me like. I feel like what that's such a saying? Western thing to do too, like from an English speaking <laughs> country, right? Uh, like like an American thing to do is just go to Mexico and be like add an ar at the end of every word and be like I'm speaking Spanish. So Gar was running around like embarrassing me, <laughs> saying like, excusar. <laughs> And eventually I was just like, what are you trying to say? And he's like, excuse me. Pardon. Like, oh my God, no. <laughs> Stop. Uh, so that's your favorite word. I think it? excuse art has to be. Like, that's the first thing that came to my head. So I think that would probably be it. <laughs> and it's not even a real word. It's not a real word, no. <laughs> oh <my God>. Brilliant. <laughs> Butchering the Spanish. And from the polyglot. <laughs> right, you've got too many choices, haven't you, Katie? I you... can't even think of like... This is a, this is a very and I feel so much pressure to come up with. A but really it's a good foreign answer. word. So maybe something from Hindi, because what Spanish wouldn't be foreign to you, would it? I mean, it still would count as a, a foreign language, I guess. For most listeners, it would be foreign because they're ah, listening in go. English. So you could do mm. something. So there you from. go. My my favorite words in the German language, and it's fünf. What fünf. does that mean? <laughs> Five. Oh, oh fünf. <laughs> <laughs> und. Actually, und would, would be a close second for me because I just love the way it sounds. It just means and. Und. Yeah, und. <laughs> I mean, I do go around, but I don't... This is two words, though. Yeah, go for it. I, I like to, like, startle Garov every now and then. Uh, <laughs> Yesterday, I scared him so bad. Like, he... Okay, anyway, he threw out his back. But <laughs> I like to just... <laughs> Jacuse. <laughs> it was a terrible start to a Friday morning. It was not my intention, though. But he just, like, 
froze. Um, wow. No, no, no. I like to like be like, j'accuse. And then, you know, like just be super dramatic. I don't know if that's mm-hmm. like. <laughs> I think that's, that's, that wouldn't that's be my it's favorite. Just French, yeah? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, I accuse you. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess. <laughs> and ne- you need the pointed finger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You got to say it in the certain tone of voice as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. J'accuse. <laughs> I thought it would be some French word for some reason. That's what I thought it would be. That's the only one, <laughs> the only phrase I can think of that I use a lot. But yeah, I guess. I can't live without it. <laughs> what is your favorite souvenir? How am I a souvenir? <laughs> Brought you all the way um, from Singapore. <laughs> I think my favorite souvenir was... Actually, funny enough, you were not there for that trip. I think my favorite souvenir would have been when uh, I picked up a painting in Hong Kong from a street artist of the Hong Kong skyline. I still have it somewhere. And it was like a hand-drawn... like It was on canvas... And it's one of my, it, it holds import, a, a lot of importance to me for some reason. That's my favorite mm. souvenir. Um. Oh, well, I have a, a souvenir I oh, got I last. Which one are you thinking? The, the Trans-Siberian. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was going to say something. Else. You can say that as that well. That one's better. No, no, I like that one. <laughs> I was going to say like the prints I got from France last year, but no, the Trans Siberian. Yeah, so uh, when you go on the Trans Siberian, okay. you, you can, like, they let you borrow like a mug to make your tea in because you, you make all your food uh-huh. yourself or you go to the dining car. So they'll give you like a mug because there's the samovar and you just constantly are drinking tea all day and sitting and looking out the window. But you can also buy one of these mugs, and they're like kind of really funky looking with uh, very industrial. It's like a steel. Is it? It's a steel, steel placeholder base. Yeah, and then and the, glass the glass goes mug. inside it, and it's got like oh, wow. an eagle. Is it yeah. an eagle? The bird? Yeah, it's very Russian looking, I guess. Uh, but yeah, that would be my favorite souvenir. Like I brought that back. I use it every day. I drink my coffee out of it almost every day so you you bought one or you stole one no bought it no <laughs> because because we had like such a such we a had nice, such a uh, great um provodnik yeah. who was like the car attendant um like he never smiled but we knew he loved us <laughs> we suspected pavel was actually very fond of us right no we didn't want to we didn't want to screw pavel by like stealing something and then we didn't know like would he get in trouble so yeah so we we yeah. actually bought it but um yeah that's one of my favorites for sure yeah and the last one and this one i assume is going to be very very easy for you to answer what is your favorite or who is your favorite travel companion Hmm, let me think. <laughs> oh, that's a difficult one, Alan. That's so sure. Not you in a car. <laughs> <I'm just saying. laughs> but the rest of the time, yes, you are yes. my favorite. <laughs> well, we can, I think we can take another question. That, well, like, what are the chances that that's the question? We'll, we take, we'll take another question. How about that? <laughs> you want another question? Yeah. I, say, I say you don't want to answer that one, Godav. No, no, we oh, already yeah, did. Are you, are you avoiding it? You didn't I mean, say that's me. sort of a given. You didn't direct say me it's, it is me right it's Catherine <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah <laughs> too easy that one I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> my favorite four I guess what I want to ask you now is about your I guess you could call it your brand because it's Katie and Godav but collectively you guys are called third culture nomads and this is your online mm-hmm. presence I suppose is a way of putting it and I find that title is very, very interesting and intriguing to me, but I don't quite exactly, I don't, there is, there's, a, there's a story behind this, isn't there? So could you explain what third culture nomads means as, as your, your collective title? Sure. So essentially, there's this concept called third culture kids, uh, which basically means you are a person of you originally belong to one culture but you grew up in a secondary culture which is not your culture but you feel so you look like you may belong to one culture so for example in Katie's case she was born in the US her parents are American so she's supposed to be American but she grew up in <laughs> Mexico and so in her heart and in in the way she thinks I can sense it as well she's a through and through Mexican Right, right, and it's sort of I this, appreciate that, and it's, <laughs> it's it's so nice to hear. <laughs> and it's sort of the same for me. I grew up in India, but like I said, my formative years as an adult was spent in Singapore, mm. and I sort of confused about what is home, right? Because is it India? Is it Singapore? And that's 
the term which is used for for folks of that sort is the, the term is called TCK, which is third cult third culture kids, because you don't belong to one culture, you don't belong to the second culture, so you create your own culture, which is a fusion of the cultures that you're aware of to create a third culture. Right. Right. That's sort of the meaning behind that, and obviously nomads are just because be- between the, f- the the two of us, we bring in sort of four different cultures, if you may. Mm. We've constantly on the move. Like I think Katie has this thing where she can't be in one city for more than four years or five I mean, years. Yeah, we actually re- we realized this very <laughs> recently, but um, because we were starting to get antsy in London, and we lived in London for about four years. Mm. And I don't think we could quite put our finger on why, but we were just like, uh, we have to go. And I think also because we haven't traveled this year, but we were like, uh, we have to make a change. Uh, so we moved to York and I was telling my brother about it, who is obviously also a third culture adult. And he was like, oh, well, that's like your third culture kid thing coming out where it's like uh, you just need frequent change because it's like that's what you were used to growing up right where it's like um it's kind of something similar that probably like military kids might experience right where like you move around enough and it's kind of yeah like you just it's part of your identity really to just need like need new experiences very very frequently yeah yeah so yeah but that that basically yeah i guess you explained it so well i didn't need to add to it i think essentially it goes back to the point of you're confused about what home is or what your identity is because mm. you you don't feel at home anywhere you go or you feel at home everywhere you go. Either way sort of works. So I think that's why we went with third culture nomads because we sort of just moving around in this uh, in this world where every- And I think it's lucky too to meet another third culture nomad and marry another uh, not a nomad sorry another third culture kid and (laughs) like you know like another third culture adult and then like become a couple and get married because it's just kind of like no one can really understand you yeah and your experiences the way another third culture adult can and if you date someone who's always lived in the same country who's you know like very american grew up with like that culture it's very hard for someone to kind of even if they try to like really fully understand like how you feel um Mm -hmm. yeah like how displaced you can feel in a country that is supposed to be your country that that you're supposed to belong there but it's just kind of like you never quite fit into place and i think that's the great thing about garov and i think that's one of the things that actually worked out well for us and one of the reasons why um our relationship works is because uh he knows that feeling and so it's like I never have to explain why do I feel this way? Like why do I feel like I don't I don't want to live in the US because I don't belong there? Mm. I never have to explain that because Garov Garov knows. Gets yeah, it. Yeah, Garov gets it. So yeah, we're third culture adults. <laughs> that might be the root of your success as a couple too, perhaps. I think so, yeah. yeah. Because I think also as third culture kids, like you learn to adjust a lot more quickly to foreign situations or like a mm. Yeah, like to new places and things like that. So I think like both of us coming from that background and understanding what that feels like. Yeah, definitely. And I think the other thing which we might have not even sort of raised, might have mentioned in passing was the fact that we left our homes at a very young age and have been sort of living independently. Right. I think that brings along with it a certain set of skills, if I can call them skills. Yeah. Uh, where so. where you where you know how to sort of survive and also be like life skills yeah mm-hmm. exactly yeah right like because like I said I left home and as I've been living independently ever since I was about fifteen and the same thing with Katie when she went to Cuba I was seventeen I guess but yeah but that that was it's still yeah. young isn't yeah, it yeah I guess so <laughs> <laughs> and to be on your own and just do your own thing and go learn ballet and a foreign yeah country, learn so. I guess yeah like you have to learn to figure things out yeah for sure the last point I guess I could call it I have is something that I've been thinking on ever since I watched a a TV program when I was at university and it was a travel program and it was a competitive travel program and it used to be about couples racing around the world (laughs) and getting into all sorts of strife and it was highly entertaining for me (laughs) not for them though I'm guessing (laughs) and I'm sure all couples as we've briefly touched on when they're traveling, go through moments of stress, being in a foreign place, being tired and being edgy and at each other's throats. These situations are something that need to be navigated successfully for 
two people to travel successfully. Mm -hmm. The curious thing about you guys, you've always traveled. I mean, you guys began traveling mm -hmm. together and your relationship started and grew out of traveling. I have this idea that if anybody was wanting to, let's say, commit to a full-time relationship with somebody, if they had not traveled before together, do you think that could be a good way to test the longevity of a possible long, uh, long-term relationship? Because if they were able to survive a journey and not have a falling out, then they basically should survive mm -hmm. a lifelong relationship. What, what do you think about that idea? I, <laughs> I definitely agree to that. I mean, I, 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 it's, it's a notion I've held for a while myself uh, because of sort of how we went through it. Because like I said, in a short amount of time, if you survive that, you really know the person and it feels like you've known that person for years, right? So mm. it's a good test of uh, the success of a relationship if you can survive it because it puts a lot of stress and strain um, and you see sides to a person that you wouldn't otherwise. And I think if you can survive like a, a trip to a foreign country in a different language, different culture, and you can survive that, and navigate through that successfully i certainly believe that, that that's that's a good proxy to to see how <laughs> how long you'd be together as a couple and whether you'd be successful i mean i guess it's also about being willing to take that risk right um because you have to accept maybe there's a possibility it won't work like this mm. is just yeah like this is too intense of a situation and and that can be scary as well i think to like mm. decide okay i'm gonna travel with this person how's this going to turn out, right? And uh, there's no guarantee that, yeah, like that, that'll that be great. And, you know, so, um, yeah, like definitely it, it will it will put your relationship to the test. And I think that as long as you're willing to acknowledge that everybody adjusts at a different rate, for example, to certain situations. So like if you move abroad, you might adjust more quickly than your partner and your patient. Um, you can work through it, but yeah, but I guess like there is definitely some, like we've known couples who have broken up yeah. traveling, right? So there is, there is some risk and, and, and going back to like an earlier point we talked about where it's like, you just have to be real, really realistic about what it means to travel as a couple. Because I, I do think like we've seen people go into kind of like with this very romanticized yeah. idea of like traveling the world with you know, your significant other mm -hmm. and it can be really great, but yeah, like, like it will put you to the test. It really will. And, um, you just have to be going to it with your eyes open that this can happen and you definitely will argue and you definitely will have moments where you're just like, <laughs> ah, I can't stand you, you know, <laughs> put up like the invisible barrier in the car so that you yeah. don't talk to each other for a while. <laughs> a COVID shield. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I, I do think like it's a good marker. Um, if travel is very important to you as a person, yeah, then yeah, definitely traveling probably as early on as you can to yeah. kind of get an idea early on like is this is this something that's feasible um mm -hmm. yeah like don't put it off thinking you know like there's time like i think you should you should figure these things out as early as possible yeah sure just to sort of continue that point and i won't take long i promise <laughs> uh, um <laughs> the other reason for that there's sort of a hidden intangible reason for that right because when you're traveling let's say you're you're like in a setup where you you're having a dinner together and maybe let's say you're in istanbul and you're sort of sitting by the bosphorus and you're having dinner together you talk about things you wouldn't talk about when you when you're in a different setup let's say you're just dating someone locally and you you're going for a dinner you talk about things which are maybe more superficial but i i realize this with katie like we talk about things which are more sort of uh, philosophical about and that sort of gives you an idea of how tuned or how attuned you are to each other from a moral compass point of view mm -hmm. uh, from a uh, from where your beliefs lie yeah. and I think those conversations are really important to to understand whether you're compatible as uh, as, as a couple as well and those are conversations which for some reason don't come up if you don't travel at least that's what we felt right I mean, that's also a good point, though, because, like, it's a good chance to see how someone treats, treats people, people in yeah. different cultures exactly. and different settings, right? How quickly they can adjust and get over stereotypes and, uh, yeah, just in general, like, how they are towards 
people that are completely different from them, for example, in a foreign country, that maybe you cannot understand that person's perspective or the kind of life they've had, but like you seeing how a partner will react to people, how they treat people, and even like very mundane situations, like how they behave towards somebody in a, in a shop, for example, like the clerk or things like that, like that really will show you the kind of person they are, especially like when you're in a more mm. stressful situation or you're in a new situation, right? I think it really brings out who you really are. And uh, it's a good chance to see like what kind of person you're actually traveling with just based on like their reactions in stressful situations or in different situations or in foreign situations. Right? It doesn't necessarily have to be stressful. I guess I keep acting like, <laughs> like it's just awful, you know, the second. You... No, yeah. But I guess like in, in situations where things are slightly uncomfortable, right? Because it's different and new. Yeah. It's a, it's a good opportunity to, to see somebody for yeah. who they really are uh, when they're on the spot. Yeah. That's all really good advice. <laughs> so much advice we've given today. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's a good place to, to leave it there. I mean, we've, we've hit the, the 90 minute mark more or less, and there's been some really interesting points and some nice experiences that you shared from your journey together. So I just like to say thank you. Katie and Gaurav, Third Culture Nomads, yeah, for coming on and telling us about how to be successful couples who travel. Well, thanks for uh, having us. Yeah, yeah we, we're so happy we got to do this. Thanks for listening to The Nostalgic Vagabond. I hope you enjoyed listening to our conversation. And if you would like to listen to other interesting talks on travel, there are more podcasts available. Check them out wherever you get your podcasts. And for updates, just follow me at The Nostalgic V. Don't forget, your journey is special. Own it. I've been Alan Hill. Until next time. Hey guys, if you enjoy listening to The Nostalgic Vagabond, why not support the podcast? If you haven't already, subscribe and you'll be notified when new apps drop. You can also support the podcast by leaving a rating or a review on your podcast app. Why not share this episode? Tell your friends about it if something resonated with you. Word of mouth is great promotion. If you're into social media, maybe post a screenshot of the episode or upload the link on your profile so your mates can see what interesting content you've been into lately. All your support comes straight back and helps to keep the travel content and nostalgia of this podcast going. Cheers. So don't forget to subscribe. And it's and nice think... to be referred to as a successful couple who travels. <laughs> 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 I like this title. <laughs>